Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm continuing um, this series of videos on redrawing the map. So I'm talking about the peer-reviewed uh, paper now on how northern lakes are not getting covered in ice in the winter. Instead of being annually ice covered, they're intermittently covered or not covered at all. And this has a huge impact on freshwater ecosystems and the people that live around these lakes. So, and just uh, recently I just posted um, some images when I was walking on a lake um, with, you know, the ice was about 12 inches thick. Okay, so here's the paper. Widespread loss of lake ice around the northern hemisphere in a warming world. These are all open source, by the way. So if you just Google the title, you can find the paper, open the PDF, and you can look at, uh, you know, what it is. But I'm just going to basically give the, the highlights or the lowlights of it. Um, so lakes are, lake ice is threatened by climate change. So basically, this is a really, these are really interesting results here. So when the mean, the biggest factor they found from their study, looking at all these lakes, you know, and it was in North America, it was in Asia, you know, some in Europe as well. Um, all over, they found that when the mean air temperature above the lake is warmer than 8.4 degrees Celsius, the lake will would only have intermittent winter ice. So, that, so the whole surface of the lake wouldn't freeze every year. Okay, you might have some ice around the edges, um, depends on the variability of the weather, but basically you're not going to have annual winter ice. The whole lake the whole lake is not going to freeze solid. When the mean air temperature is less than 8.4 degrees Celsius, then other factors come into play. So if the lake is very shallow, less than 24 meters deep, then the water goes to 4 degrees Celsius at the surface, sinks to the bottom. It's not very deep. It goes all the way to the bottom of the lake. When the whole lake is 4 degrees Celsius in the vertical column, then the, the water at the surface can go less than 4 degrees Celsius down to zero, freeze and form your ice. So you get annual winter ice in this case. 98% of the lakes that satisfied these two conditions had annual winter ice. When the lake is deeper than 24 meters, okay, then, then it won't always have annual winter ice. Now look, the next factor to look at is the elevation. So if the elevation, if the lake is at high elevation, greater than 279 meters high above sea level, then it's a bit colder as you go up higher, radiation and wind changes. So you get annual winter ice in this case. 96% of the lakes had winter ice. But when you're at lower elevations, okay, then a different thing happens. And you need to look at the factor of the shoreline complexity. So if you if there's inlets and stuff, you know, if there's a lot of inlets and little coves and peninsulas and stuff, then the shoreline complexity factor, if it's greater than a certain threshold, 5.2, um, then you get ice in this lake because the ice can form in the coves and stuff and then it can spread. Okay, if the shoreline is pretty smooth and uh, not no not very many inlets and stuff, then you get intermittent ice in this case. Okay, so all the lakes can be classified; they can be slotted into these regions, and you can see whether the lake is going to freeze or not. So some lakes that are next to each other, you know, will get the annual winter ice coverage. Others will get intermittent or no ice, depending on the elevation, the mean depth, shoreline complexity, those other factors. So these are some histograms showing the, this is the number of lakes, okay? The blue is they get annual winter ice, so the whole lake freezes over the winter. The red is the intermittent winter ice, they won't completely freeze. And what you can see here is, this is the mean air temperature. So when the mean air temperature, this, is, this would be uh, the 8 degrees here, would be about here, 8.4 degrees threshold. Okay, so the other factors come into play, but most of the lakes will freeze. And uh, th this is the, th these are the number of lakes that have the intermittent ice. These are the ones, so the temperature is slightly higher. Most of them would have intermittent winter ice. This is the 8.4, roughly the peak here. 
Okay, then mean depth here. Okay, um, so now the mean depth, and uh, you can see the, the, the lakes that freeze each winter, the distribution of them, and the ones that have intermittent ice, then the elevation effect comes into play, and then the shoreline complexity comes into play. Okay, so those are the key factors. This is, this is a really useful table for looking at a lake. You know, you look at the different factors and you can see whether it freezes intermittently or, uh, you know, whether it has intermittent winter ice, so it doesn't completely freeze over, or whether every year it freezes over, you know, solid coating of ice. You know, and this is if there's not, uh, you know, of course, if there's moving water in the lake, if there's channels and stuff with moving water, then the, uh, you know, moving water, you know, rivers coming in, then, the, the, you know, of course, that the, the lake won't freeze in that case. Okay, narrow channels and things like that. Those are other factors that aren't considered in here or they're not portrayed in there. Okay, so this shows you um, a map here now. Okay, so basically what you see is this is, uh, you know, if you take the entire range here, these are lakes that have annual winter ice. Okay, that includes the black and all the colors. Okay, now if the, the ones with intermittent winter ice currently are the brown shaded ones at the edge here. Okay, so the furthest south lakes, they can have intermittent coverage. Some years they'll freeze solid, other years, like the surface, they'll get a layer on the surface, other years they won't. Okay, or they'll have open areas. As long as there's open areas, um, you know, that, that, then um, that's where they, that's the extent of these lakes. Now with two degrees warming air temperature, then all of these other purple ones then become intermittent. 3.2 degrees, the yellow ones become intermittent. 4.5, the blue, and then the red at plus eight degrees Celsius air temperature above this region, all the red ones become intermittent. Okay, they don't freeze over, they don't have annual winter ice, they don't freeze over every year. And this is, don't forget because of Arctic amplification, you know, if Arctic amplification at these high latitudes is, is say three or four, call it four times, then global average temperatures would just have to increase about two degrees. That would cause eight degrees up in this region, causing the lakes not to freeze each year and be intermittent. Okay, uh, this is showing the number of lakes. So on the, here are the te here's a temperature increase in degrees Celsius, and this is showing the number of lakes. So as you increase the temperature, the number of lakes that don't freeze goes up exponentially. And the reason is, is that as you go, the number of lakes potentially experiencing intermittent winter ice cover is projected to increase exponentially with climate warming, reflecting the greater density of lakes at higher latitudes. So as you go to higher and higher latitudes, you have more and more lakes. Okay, so there's more and more lakes that will not, that will only, will not freeze annually, it will only have intermittent ice coverage. Okay, this is the number of countries that are affected. This is the number of people that are affected um, directly by, you know, living beside the lakes, etc. Okay, so it's huge numbers of people, and then they looked at four lakes, and this is the mean air temperature, and they showed where they, ex the year they expected those lakes to uh, go to an intermittent. Um, so this is the intermittent threshold, the 8.4. Okay, so when the temperature crosses that, you know, at these particular locations where these lakes are, there, the, you can look at any given lake and say, you know, when you think it will go um, to intermittent. Okay, so this is crucial. Now, here's another study about cities using climate analogs. Climate of North American cities will shift hundreds of miles in one generation. Okay, so you can see, you know, the climate, you have the climate of Washington, D.C., you know, with the expected temperature increase and precipitation change, you know, in, in one generation, what will the climate of Washington be? And it, you'd have to go to these regions here. The present climate of these particular regions are what will Washington will expect. Okay, so like I said, you don't have to move to get experience a different climate. Just stick around for a while and the climate is going to change underneath you. And of course, this causes huge amounts of, of stress to people. You know, they looked at 540 urban areas and two emission scenarios. And the thing is, is, uh, you know, this is um, 
Okay, so I'll talk about, you know, the, why this study is so important. So here's, this is the website talking about the city and the cities, and this is the paper. Okay, so this is sort of key. You know, a major challenge in articulating human dimensions of climate change lies in translating, you know, converting it to the public. Like, what does a three degree Celsius average rise mean? Most people think, well, like I said, it, it's, uh, you know, previously, you know, people think, well, you know, the average person might not think it's not a big deal, right? Most scientists think three or four degrees average global temperature and civilization is going to just collapse. We won't be able to grow food, et cetera, et cetera. Are they being alarmist? No, but most people just can't quite get wrap their hands around that such a temperature change within the range of a daily temperature change, you know, if, <laughs> is or much less, actually. I mean, you know, uh, we're getting, you know, one day right now it might be minus 20, and then a few days later, that's Celsius, a few days later it's zero during the day. You know, 20 degree shift, or it might go from minus 20 at night to minus eight during the day, that's a 12 degree shift in one day. So we're talking about a three degree shift, you know, in a number of years, let's say it happened, you know, a century, you know, why, it, why would it knock out civilization? People don't, yeah, there's a bit disconnect with that. Okay. So, um, you know, so within, a, so, so basically it's very important to read this, to figure out. So this is a good way of putting it basically, you know, you can see, you know, if you want to see what your climate is going to be like soon in Washington, D.C., it tells you where you need to drive to, you know, with, you know, a thousand miles away or 500 miles away or 800 miles away to see what sort of climate you, you'll you expect. Now, this is given, this is with, you know, for your, your grandkids, etc. Now, this is, um, of course, you know, this has a lot of assumptions. It assumes that, you know, we don't have um, like huge outbursts of methane or, it has a lot of assumptions that probably, you know, that uh, probably aren't justified in having. But, you know, the study has to start somewhere. Okay, so, you know, it's very... So here's Washington. This is the analog. You know, this is how well the matching climate is. So you're going the best one. The best, you know, it's, it's uh, 0.57 standard deviations from the existing climate would be in this region here. Okay, so you can do that for all of the different cities. Okay, so let's have a look at the, um, so let's have a, <coughs> a look here. So I'm just clicking on the links. Okay, there we go. Okay, so I'm going to put in uh, Ottawa, Ontario. Ottawa, Canada. Okay, so for high emissions, Ottawa's climate in 2080 will feel most like today's climate near South Shore, Illinois. Here's South Shore, Illinois. Typical winter is 11 Fahrenheit or 6.1 Celsius warmer, 23.3% drier than winter in Ottawa. Okay, so that's the line to the most similar climate. Line and climate similarity map. Refresh map. Okay, uh, what's it doing? Oh, it lost Ottawa. There's Ottawa. Climate similarity map. Okay, so here's where you see the different regions of shading showing you the highest uh, similarity. So let's go back here. Um, average of 40, 27 forecast is shown here. Uh, oh, first of all, high, this is with high current high emissions. What if we reduce emissions? So if we reduce some, then the shift won't be as much. Okay, so this is uh, this is RCP 4.5, I believe this is RCP 8.5. You can see the shift with different levels of emissions. You can also, this is the average showing one line, and you can look at the, in, the individual forecasts, they're all here. Okay, so that's under the high emissions, that's under the low emissions, Right, so there's lots of different places that have similar forecasts, but the then you take sort of the average, and uh, you know this is where you get down to average them all. You get down to one line, and that's how your climate is going to shift. This is crucial for food growing regions. You know, if an area that is great for growing particular crops is is at a certain location, where will it be? Will it be pushed off the continent? Will there be analogs for some of them? There's not analog. So thanks for listening. I'll do one more video on this.